<laughs> this is Girl Talk, brought to you from Girls Preparatory School, Chattanooga, Tennessee. Hello, I'm Dr. Autumn Graves, head of Girls Preparatory School in Chattanooga, Tennessee. You are listening to the Girl Talk podcast, episode six. In this episode, I sit down with Dr. Lisa Damore, author of New York Times bestselling book, Untangled, and the executive director of Laurel School Center for Research on Girls, and unpack a few of the topics she covers in her book, Untangled, and in the presentations to parents, our girls, and our faculty and staff during her visit to GPS. Dr. Damore's second book, Under Pressure, will be released in February 2019. So welcome, Lisa. We're so happy to have you here at GPS. I am so happy to be here. I have had so much fun with your community. Can you share with us some tools and tips you think parents should have in order to best parent and love their daughters through the transitions into adulthood you write about? Sure. So, you know, I wrote Untangled because I really did want to break the chaos of adolescence down into seven distinct developmental tasks that girls are working to accomplish. And I think that when we do that, we can start to see adolescence from the girl's perspective. And this, I think, as a parent, is so hard to do because you see your daughter from your perspective. And then when she's acting in ways that make zero sense to you, it is very hard to know what to do in response. So each chapter of Untangled really does try to unpack one of the developmental tasks a girl is doing and how she is working at that task. And in my experience, often when parents actually understand what is driving their daughter's behavior, all of a sudden they can figure out new ways to respond that were not available before. If I had to say a few kind of overarching things that um, apply across the board in terms of responding to teenage girls, I think that the fundamental first and foremost thing I would say is do not take your teenage daughter too personally. You know, that a lot of what goes on between parents and adolescents is not nearly as personal as it feels to the parent. So the girl who comes home and walks right up to her room, closes the door, and does not come out for three hours, it is very easy for the parent to receive that as a rejection. She doesn't want to talk to me. She hasn't seen me all day. What was that about? There's a very good chance that she had a very long and hard day, and she was in crowded class all day long or just in too close quarters with girls all day, you know, whether here or at, you know, her school that's not nearly as kind in terms of its space. And she is just tired from being with people, and she has a lot of work, and she needs to recover, and she knows the fastest path to that recovery is to go have some time alone in her room. So we could take that example, and we could march it all through adolescence of things girls do that are not as personal as it feels to the parent. And once the parent can see that, they then relax, and then they have a lot of options for how to respond. I think another thing is sort of a universal way to think about responding to adolescent girls' behavior is that if the parent is responding at the height of anger or the height of anxiety, it's probably not going to go well. That's not to say that you can't sometimes feel super mad at your kid. And of course, if you're parenting a teenager, you're going to feel anxious at times. But I think sometimes parents start off with that or let that dominate their reaction too often. And usually it makes more work for them in trying to mop up the situation. So I think the more that parents can have incredibly awesome support around them as they are parenting teenagers, the better. Because I think as the parent of a teenager, you often do need to be able to like phone a friend (laughs) and say, you're not going to believe what my kid just did. And have that friend talk you off the ceiling before you actually interact with your kid. So are you saying that parents at times need to settle their glitter too? Can you share with our listeners how you learned about the glitter jar? I think it's a great visual for parents. Yes. Okay. I love this. So I learned this from the counselors at Ursuline Dallas School. And apparently other people are using these glitter jars too, but it was so brilliant the way they presented it to me. So I was down there and we were talking about girls having meltdowns, you know, girls becoming overwhelmed, which anyone who's around girls knows this is like a fairly common occurrence, right? And for those of us who are used to girls, it's not that alarming. Like, you know, they kind of they'll fall apart, she'll cry a while, then she'll be fine. You know, we're sort of accustomed to this. And it's actually one of the things I love about girls' schools, that by and large adults don't overreact when a girl cries. 
you know, that we just sort of see it as part of the day and we carry on, which I think is really great. But I was talking with these counselors about the glitter jar and or about girls having meltdowns. And one of the counselors said, well, that's when we go get a glitter jar. And I thought, what is she talking about? And she came back with a jam-sized jar, clear um, glass. The label was off, and it was full of water, and it had the lid glued on, and it also had about two tablespoons of sparkly purple glitter in it. And she said, when a girl comes to my office and she's really upset, I shake the glitter jar, and I say to her, this is what your brain is like right now. You know, and it was this like, you know, just this snowstorm of purple glitter. It was like a snow globe, you know, that had been shaken up. And then she says, and then I say to the girl, first, let's settle your glitter. And what the counselor would do is put the glitter jar down on the table between them. And they would actually watch it. And she did this while we were talking. And it's actually really very mesmerizing. You know, it's like watching a snow globe reset. There's something almost meditative about it. And so she would said, you know, then the glitter would settle and the girl would calm down. And then what she found and what I have found as I've started to think in this ways is that alone fixes 90% of the problem. And so I have really reformed my practice both at home and in my office when I'm confronted with a girl who's very, very upset because our impulse is to say, well, what's wrong? And what did you do? Or what, you know, how come you didn't study harder for that test? And I think it's almost the equivalent of shaking this glitter jar. And what's so beautiful about this glitter jar is that it really does capture the neurology of adolescent emotion. And it's something I wrote about in Untangled, but I didn't have this glitter jar analogy until I went to Dallas. But what we know about the teenage brain is that it remodels over the course of adolescence and becomes faster and more powerful. And everybody can watch this happen. I mean, we watch this happen in school. But it remodels in the order in which it initially evolved, which is from the most primitive regions to the most sophisticated regions. So it turns out that the emotions are in the most primitive regions, back by the spinal cord. And so the trouble with 13 and 14-year-olds is they have what we call gawky brains, that their emotion centers are totally refurbished and powerful and fast, and their perspective-maintaining centers are still under construction or getting their upgrades. When they are calm, girls can out-reason us. Their perspective-maintaining centers, their logical reasoning centers are excellent. If a teenage girl becomes very, very upset, her disproportionately powerful emotion centers can overtake the whole system and take it down. And so the brilliance of this glitter jar is it actually just puts into concrete form what it would look like if we just give the brain time to reset, give the emotion centers time to sort of, for lack of a better term, kind of get back in their box, and let the rest of the brain, the sort of clear mind, the clear jar, come back online. And either the girl is not nearly so upset and does, and her perspective is back and she can just move on from the problem, or she can come up with a decent solution to the problem. But trying to talk to a girl in a glitter storm is not a good use of anybody's time. You talked about perfection. Mm -hmm. And I really appreciated your reframing that in terms of helping girls to be more tactical. Yes. I'd like for you to talk a bit about what you mean by girls needing to be tactical And how you think the adults in their lives can be supportive of this reframing of this construct of perfection. This topic, I have to say, my mind is just turning to it. So I'm so excited to talk about it because I'm still forming my thoughts around it. But it's a problem we talk about all the time. And what we see are girls who over time become more and more tightly wound and more and more unforgiving of themselves and more and more driven and who really become quite panicked when things are not exactly as they feel they should be. You know, when not when they're not getting a perfect grade in every class and when they're not getting along with others or, you know, everything can just feel so fragile to them. 
And then we think like, oh, why is she so perfectionistic? Like what happened here, you know, and how do we get her to back it off, right? And then if you say to her, honey, don't worry so much, you know, you don't have to work so hard. I've never seen that work, right? I think they feel almost offended. Like, I think I'm supposed to be taking care of everything. I think I'm doing everything you've ever asked of me. Like, what are you doing telling me to back it off now? So I've tried to think a lot about how do we get there? You know, how do certain girls get there? And one of the things that I've started to notice, and I'm think other people notice it too. You know, people seem to be in agreement when I point this out. Is that parents who have sons are completely accustomed to the idea that a boy will decide what grade he wants in a class and then he will do as exactly as much work as he needs to do to get that grade and not an ounce more. And when I s- express this in large groups, like all the parents start nodding, right? You know that they are completely familiar with this strategy among boys. And I think we just sort of accept this, that boys will do this. And then the corollary is that those of us who are around girls just accept that a girl who's got an A in a class, who has such a high A, she probably can't lose it unless, you know, she just stops doing all of her work, will continue for every test and every quiz to make the same hundred flashcards she made early in the school year to get the exact same grades on these tests and quizzes that she got early in the school year, even though she could basically phone in the work for the remainder of the semester and still have an A. And we just accept these two things without questioning them much. I'm really cautious as a psychologist to avoid value judgments. Like, I just am curious about phenomenon, right? So it's interesting when you think about the boys. Like, they're highly efficient. If they miscalculate, they're in trouble, right? That's the thing. They have no margin. And I don't spend a lot of time taking care of boys, but I do know that the boy will feel like he perfectly estimated how much work he had to do, and then he wasn't as ready as he thought he was, and now he's in trouble because he doesn't have the padding in his you know, points. And I know this drives parents of boys crazy sometimes. So we should probably question the boys' tactics at some level in terms of just making sure that they at least have a margin for error. And I think we need to be questioning the girls' tactics, too, because it's manageable, I think, for a lot of girls in the seventh grade. It's manageable for girls in the eighth grade to use these highly conscientious strategies and to use them everywhere all the time without question. You get these junior girls who are taking three APs and doing test prep, and they are using the exact same highly inefficient strategies that have worked for them for years and they are getting no sleep and they are having no fun and they are so wedded to these strategies at this point that they will not let them go because why would they they work extraordinarily well and I am convinced that by junior year it is too late to be having these conversations another way we can think about it is People do what they know works. And if you make 100 flashcards for every quiz and you're getting an A on every quiz, why would you change up your system, experiment with it as a high school junior when that grade now feels very precious? So in schools, I think one of the things we need to do is we need to have these conversations in the 7th grade and the 8th grade about strategies for studying efficient strategies for studying, and letting girls experiment in the 7th and 8th grade with working this much, working that much, and seeing what gets them the outcomes they want. And then, hopefully, sending them into high school where all of a sudden everything feels like it counts, feeling like they know how to operate in lots of different ways with the work, And that they have a repertoire that they can draw on about when they want to put the pedal to the metal and give something everything they've got, maybe because it's a hard class or because they love it, right? That's like, that's a great time to do 100 flashcards. You love the material. 
And they should also have another gear they can drop into when they already have the grade they want or they don't feel they need an A, right? Or um, they don't have time and they have an efficient strategy they can fall back on that they are not pulling out for the first time as a junior. You know, Lisa, I, I'd like to push a little bit on yeah. this, the end of what you were saying, because I think this is where some of the challenges, you, you've introduced this construct of choices. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's where a lot of times we as a school, I would say, run into some challenges with our families mm-hmm. and their girls because we are saying you need to make some choices and they are afraid to make choices. And so the choice of by you choosing to want to be involved in these particular co-curricular, or extracurricular activities, you don't have as much time yep. to devote to these college level courses. Because I think we sometimes forget that an AP class is a college class mm-hmm. taught to people who haven't had all of the foundational background to take the college class. So mm-hmm. we're doing all of the high school background and teaching the college class in one year. Yep. And they're doing multiples of these. And then there's a sense of that's a lot of work and she needs to make an A. Mm-hmm. And that idea of saying, yes, it's a lot of work, but maybe you could do less and make a B. Right. Seems we don't go there. Yeah. I mean, that is how could you think that I would want my daughter to make a B? Right. And that's all you want her to do. It's like, but she's made this choice Mm -hmm. to have all these other activities in her life, which bring her joy, which help her to find passion, Mm -hmm. which help her to be a well-rounded person. How do you help through those kinds of conversations? We need to be having them. Right. And I think... I'll even, you know, it's only in this conversation I'm thinking through, like, what you describe about what AP classes really require. The other thing that's different is that when you're actually a college student, you have a lot more time, Mm -hmm. right? So when you're in college, and I'm always telling girls who are seniors this, and they're so surprised to hear this. They're not sure how they're going to get all their work done. And I say, oh, my gosh, when you get to college, you're in class two or three hours a day max, right? So you actually have time to do all the work that they're loading on you. So if we think about our juniors who are taking two or three college courses, they are doing that, but they're also stuck at school all day. Their day is taken up. College is actually easier often. So here's something I'm flirting with as a solution, but I think it's a way too simple solution for the complexity of the problem that you're talking about. But I've thought about this a lot, and I keep on my desk at Laurel a grid I've made it's got seven columns and 16 hours, 16 rows. So it's seven columns, one day per week, one for every day of the week, and then 16 rows, which is one for every hour of the day, presuming the girl's getting eight hours of sleep a night, which is a massive presumption. But let's give her at least eight, though by high school she needs nine. Middle school she needs 10. Elementary school she needs at least 11. So we're already cheating her. But when girls come to me and they are totally overwhelmed, I have said, come back when you have enough time for us to fill this entire thing out. And I go through and I make them block out where all the time is going. So we basically take the whole school day out and we X out those boxes. And then we think about the classes she has, how much of that work she can do during the school day and how many hours she has left afterwards. And then we block out those hours. And then we look at things like she's on the swim team, and we block out those hours. And then we look at things like she needs to take a shower, (laughs) and she needs to eat dinner, and we block out that time. And it is very quickly that we see that the reason she's overwhelmed is what she's saying she wants to do cannot actually be done. So I've done this with a couple of girls, and sometimes it's helped them to say, you know what, actually... I could do that thing faster if I weren't watching Netflix at the same time. So sometimes we can recover some time. Sometimes they can say, you know what, I need to say to my mom, I can't go to my brother's hockey games anymore. Right? So sometimes it just helps us see where the time actually goes. And that's helpful. But I do wonder if on the school side, if when parents are saying we want her to take these classes, if we were to pull out this sheet and say, we are with you, we just want to make sure it's physically possible. I wonder if that would give us a neutral way to talk about what we are loading on to girls 
that takes it away from some idea that somehow this girl doesn't try hard enough or wouldn't try hard enough or, you know, has some inadequacy, but that really looks at it in the cold light of actual time, right? And what you were talking about, like, they have extracurriculars, and they should, or they should have leisure, right? So it gets complex because there's busier and less busy times of the year. You know, it gets complex in terms of what we think a weekend should look like. But I've started to play with this idea of just using the clock as the bully. I like that. The clock as the bully. That's great. Once we've helped girls get better at setting healthy parameters, how do we guide them and not giving up when the work gets challenging? Say for a student who struggles with a particular subject. One of my observations over really almost 25 years of working in schools, both co-ed schools and single gender schools, is that I noticed there's a time when girls start to pull out of different activities or different experiences or they stop pushing themselves or Mm -hmm. stretching themselves. And I will say I see less of that in an all-girls environment. I see actually significantly less of that. Mm -hmm. But there's still a little bit of that. Can you talk a little bit or help us to think about how do we support our girls and not pulling out? We do see this. And, and like, let's take mathematics in particular, right? Because it's very common where a girl who's a perfectly strong mathematician just pulls back and disengages and doesn't continue to press forward. And at that point, the trajectory of her math career changes very, very dramatically. We see this less in boys. And one of the reasons that we have for this is that boys and girls tend to explain failure differently. Girls are more likely to use internal and stable explanations. They're more likely to say, I am bad at math. It's an I, it's internal, and bad, it's forever. Boys are more likely than girls to use external or unstable explanations. So a boy in the same position will say, well, it was a dumb test, right? Or the teacher doesn't like me. Or if they make an internal attribution, they'll say, well, I didn't study for that test. So they'll say it's mine, but they'll say it's, I can fix it later if I want. The upshot of this is that the boy stays engaged. He feels like, oh, yeah, I got a bad grade on that test, but I'm like as good to go as I ever was for the next one, right? I have an even shot on the next one. And, you know, to exaggerate this, sometimes math teachers will say, the boys are failing and they don't even know it, right? Whereas the girls who really know what they're doing have decided they're not good at this. So one of the things that we need to be really vigilant about when we're helping girls learn is to watch for those times where they make these stable internal attributions and to say, you know what, maybe I had an off day. Or maybe, but how did the whole class do on this test? Wait, the whole class bombed the test? Maybe it wasn't you on this one. And to really look for opportunities to help them reason in ways that will keep them feeling like they should stay engaged in the content. I was really taken by two particular chapters in Untangled. One is about tribes and finding one's tribes and the challenges that can exist when girls have too many people in their tribes. Can you talk a little bit more about that idea of the tribe and the numbers of people in the tribe and pros and cons to a a, a well-populated tribe? (laughs) Exactly. So I think it's funny. You know, when you're a parent and you imagine your daughter coming into middle school, I think a lot of parents have the same vision for how they want that to go. Like, oh, wouldn't it be great if she had a bunch of friends and she was, you know, in a crew and they could all enjoy one another and then there was always a bunch of girls to do things with and I don't necessarily want her to have just one good friend because what if they don't get along or, you know, does it mean she's not actually involved in enough stuff? So I think we often envision these sort of larger groups and I think girls do too. Right. I think they worry that they won't be popular, you know, and popular by definition means populated. Right. Like lots of people. If you have one good friend, you're not popular. Right. If you have five good friends, you're in a different department. So those of us who spend a lot of time in schools know that these large groups, though they may sound great on paper, very rarely operate as well as one would like. And then what invariably happens is that people are upset because the girls are coming into conflict with one another. And then you have this problem of what's wrong with the girls? Why aren't they getting along better? What, who's messing this up? Who, what poor parent has poorly parented that child so that she is now making things hard on my kid, 
right? I mean, that, that is the invariable upshot when we have this unrealistic vision of how this is going to go. In reality, if we look at it this way, we feel better. And the way we want to look at it is it's actually not possible for five people of any age to come together in a group and like one another equally. That actually is not something humans can do. And interestingly, as adults, we very rarely attempt it, right? I mean, we mostly have our one-on-one friendships. Every once in a while, there's a group of, you know, four women who've been friends for life. That's pretty rare. For the most part, we operate in much more individual arrangements. But seventh graders get this vision that they should be able to pull this off. And what always happens, because they're human beings is that there's a subset in the group that really likes each other, you know, these three girls who really want to be together, and they don't always want to invite the other two. And so sometimes they get together on the weekend without the other two, and of course the other two find out, and then you have a full-blown drama that lasts three weeks, right? Or it always happens that there's two girls in the group who are a little bit oil and water with each other. And so invariably, the other three are pulled in to have to mediate between them, or the other three feel like they have to sometimes choose sides. You know, I mean, it just, it can be any variety of configurations. And so I think the thing we need to do as adults is just recognize when you get to larger numbers, you're going to have more drama. And then the next thing we need to do as adults is to accept that conflict comes with the territory, and then to help girls handle their conflict effectively. But I think we need to start by taking away this vision that this great, wonderful arrangement is to have a large group of friends in the middle school. Lisa, I think that is great advice for parents. The second chapter I was taken by is the one near the end of the book that asks us, as adults, to think about romantic relationships. And while I realize that all romantic relationships are not confined to male-female, for the sake of this conversation, sure. can you talk a little bit more about this idea of exceeding consent? Yep, yep. So this is a big one, and this is something I think about probably as much as I think about anything else because I feel like there's so much work for us to do on behalf of girls. So let's start by pulling the camera way, way, way back and look at this landscape of romance and romance among young people. Something we do in our culture that is so atmospheric that it is invisible to us is that we set this whole thing up that the boys will play offense and the girls will play defense. The boys are the ones with the drive. The boys are the ones who want physical things to happen. And we are going to ask the girls and it falls to the girls to regulate this process. And we see it over and over again in ways that I get mad at myself for not having seen it before. So for instance, I recently wrote a column and my editor gave it the headline, Teenagers Stop Asking for Nude Photos. So I have been in girls' environments, you know, for 14 years I've been at a girls' school. We are telling the girls, do not send inappropriate pictures. Do not send them, do not send them. Many schools have regulations against sending them. Only recently did it occur to me We're not telling anybody to not ask for them. And I thought, how has this never crossed my mind? Because it is true that occasionally a girl sends one unsolicited. Most of the time, it was a two-part interaction where somebody asked, and for the sake of this case, let's say the boy, and she sent it in response. Then when we go look at the research on this, often it's way past asking. It is harassing, it is badgering, it is threatening, that there is this whole universe of activity and this whole degree of pressure that girls are put under before they finally send the photo to try to get it to end or because they don't know what else to do. We have only ever asked the girls to regulate this process. So I went to write that article and I thought, am I missing something? This feels so obvious. How did I not see this? And I was so happy to hear Several schools reached out to me and said they actually changed their handbook to penalize asking as much as they penalize sending. And I thought, these are good heads of schools. They did not see it either. We are so bought into the boys will do what the boys are going to do. We have have to ask the girls to keep this on lockdown. So that framework infuses everything. It infuses how we do sex ed in schools. 
when you look at the research on how we do it, overwhelmingly we say to the girls, don't, 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 don't get pregnant, don't get an STD, don't, don't, don't. When we look at the research on how we do sex ed with boys, overwhelmingly we say, now young men, if you're going to have sex, be sure to wear a condom. That is overwhelmingly the messaging. So it, again, boys are on the gas, girls are on the brakes. It is everywhere. So it's also baked into our conversations about consent. We do address these conversations to both boys and girls. Make sure you get consent for whatever you're going to do. I think all of us generally have the feeling, or certainly the culture has taught us, it's the boys who are going to be pressing. It's up to the girls to decide if it happens. The word consent is completely infused with the offense-defense framework. Somebody is pressing. Somebody is giving in. So we have a lot of work to do to get out from under this thing that we unwittingly join in because it's inherently inequitable. It is sexism baked in. So back to dads. <laughs> what are we going to do? This is my vision of what a father would say to his daughter. And I know it is a real stretch from our standard orthodoxy. In my world, a dad would say to his daughter, your romantic life should be one of the most joyful and enjoyable parts of your life. There is not a lot in life that is for pure fun and enjoyment. There's ice cream. <laughs> there's shows that we binge watch, right? And there is your romantic life and the physical side of your romantic life. When the physical side of your romantic life begins, I want you to enjoy it. I want it to be healthy and happy. And the way that's going to happen is it's going to be centered around what you want to have happen. So as you go to that dance or you think about hanging out with that boy, the thing I want you to use to guide all of your decision making is what would I like and what would be fun for me? So sweetheart, start there, determine that, and then find out what your partner would like and what would be fun for him. And then together, you guys decide what you are both enthusiastically agreeing to. Consenting doesn't sound like so much fun to me. This is romance. This is physical romance. Whether we're talking about what happens next year when you're a sophomore, whether we're talking about what happens when you are a married woman, this should be happy and joyful and healthy, and it should always be what you want. And any boy who does not join you in that process and who puts what he wants ahead of what you want, or who pressures you to a degree to something that only he wants, he does not deserve to be anywhere near you. So the standard, honey, that I want you to hold is I will only date boys who care at least as much about what I want as they care about what they want, and who are ready to have a communication with me where we arrive together at a decision about what we would both really like to have happen. So that's where I want this conversation to get. It's where I think the conversation has to go. Yep, I agree. And I think for girls especially, but also for boys, the way I've heard it put that I just thought was so right is we need to move the conversation about sex, I'm just going to say sex, out of the risk category into the healthy development category. Mm -hmm. So long as it is in the risk category, which is usually where we put it for girls, we are still having the wrong conversation. When it is in the healthy development category, it's more equitable. And also, those girls face fewer risks. When girls feel like, I have a right to be here, I have a right to want what I want, I have a right to advocate for what I want, they actually have all the low-risk outcomes we say we want. So if we just look at the cold data, you get what you want. You get girls who do not have unwanted experiences if you actually endow them with a right to be there. Great. Well, I am blessed to have spent time with you, especially after reading your book, mm -hmm. Untangled. Thank you, Dr. Lisa Damore, for your gifts, oh. your perspective on girls, your love for adolescent girls, your respect for adolescent girls, and your willingness to help us adults be the best people we can be to love those girls through to adulthood. Thank you. Thank you.
And that's Girl Talk for today. Thank you for listening. If you liked the podcast, be sure to share it with your friends or leave us a review on iTunes. If you have questions or comments, please send us an email at girltalkpodcast@gps.edu, at gps.edu or feel free to tweet us at gpsbruisers. Here's to the girls. Girls.